Thanks. And today we are talking to Mary Witten, uh, and uh, she is indeed one of the leaders and pioneers of the conference and the movement and the origins of computer graphics into mainstream. So Mary, uh, please, can you start at the beginning and tell me your full name, please? I am Mary Clark Witten. Uh, my mother's maiden name was Clark, and I am a native North Carolinian. And that's where you were born, I guess? I, I was born in Charlotte, grew up there, came to the Triangle to go to Duke University, then went to NC State, then came to Carolina to work, and been, been in the Triangle ever since. So when were you born? Uh, come on now. <laughs> uh, 1948. I'm 73. Right. Three, Two, four. Three, five. <laughs> Not five yet. <laughs> so uh, tell us about your childhood and your parents, please. Uh, my dad was a Yankee. My mother was from way down east in uh, North Carolina uh, in a tobacco town. Uh, they met, like a, she came to Charlotte to, to go to Queens College, which is now Queens University, and uh, graduated there and got a teaching position as the first sixth grade teacher at Eastover Elementary School. And the construction company that my grandfather ran, my father was doing, built that school. So they met, uh, had a lot of mutual friends in Charlotte, and that's how they met. Were they smokers? No. <laughs> and you went to I great... I think actually Daddy may have, but uh, that was over long before I came along. You went to grade school there? I did. I went to that same, uh, that same elementary school. And in high school, were you interested in science and mathematics? I was indeed. Uh, uh, I went to Myers Park High, and we were uh, fortunate to have some really good math teachers, and I enjoyed that, and we had some really good science teachers, uh, a marvelous physics guy and a marvelous woman for uh, second year biology. Um, not so much history in English, but, uh, you know, I got past. Did you uh, think you'd want to make a career in science as a high school student? I am just on the cusp of the age of when women were uh, still being advised by guidance counselors, oh, your scores in math and science are high, so you should be a nurse instead of being a teacher or, or a teacher or math teacher. Um, and that was not advice you took. Oh, actually, you may not know the story, Judson. Um, <laughs> I... Uh, I went to Duke. Uh, my mother, would, they would not allow me to apply to any place north of the Mason-Dixon line. Uh, and I majored in religion. And part of the reason I did that was because it had no required minor courses. I could take 30 hours of religion to get my major requirements. And then I had 29 hours of math. So the math, I kept doing math because if I was going to teach, it was going to be math rather than, than science. What kind of math? Geometry, um, uh, algebra? Please. Uh, I actually ended up teaching junior high. So, uh, and I was, I taught in a very poor uh, tobacco town out east of Raleigh. So I was still teaching multiplication tables to junior high students. And I had a few students who actually were at grade level. Um, I really like geometry. It's kind of tidy. Uh, and the other math that's tidy like that is complex variables. Um, so two of the things I liked a lot. I found uh, as I got into computer graphics that uh, well, I did well in geometry in high school. Algebra I found to be difficult. And I went to such a small school, we didn't have much beyond that. We did take trigonometry, which seemed to be mostly manipulation of identities, yep. which I to this day don't understand very well. But geometry I understood. And uh, later at uh, uh, I, uh, when I was interested in art, I uh, think I was talking to uh, Kasich, Kasich, and he talked about, or maybe it was Jim Blinn, who uh, said he didn't know, wasn't a good drawer or anything like that. But with me, it was all of a sudden when I discovered the computer and geometry, I was able to uh, find a modus that I was able to be creative in. I am... Um... I look back at one of the things that I did when I was filling in my math background to get my teaching certificate was I took a course in, I guess it's algebraic geometry, but it, geometry from an advanced point of view, and I just loved it. So do, 
um, algebraic relationships, but that you could always draw the figures and look at the figures when they were graphed. And it just makes so much sense. You know, I think some of Blin's work is quite not necessarily completely original in that regard, but the idea that you can fuse uh, algebraic equations and geometry expressions or geometry or kinematic mechanisms yeah. is uh, was something I think in the early part of the 20th century, people kind of strove to figure out if there were equivalents there. And uh, thank God they did. Yes. And, uh, I could always animate using geometry, but I was not very good at algebra. And there were people who were mathematicians. I have had encounters with in my life who were, could solve a problem in 15 minutes that would take me 15 weeks to, to solve. So, yep. Now, you uh, somehow or another became interested in electronics. How did that um, happen? Um, so, that, that then transfer us to meeting Nick and we had mutual friends uh, among his friends at NC State and I was at Duke and met him there. He went off uh, to the work for the Navy and avoid the draft and I was teaching school and we uh, got back together at a, a spring rock concert one year. I don't know whether he told you this story or not. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so we started dating and then he moved back and he went to John Stodhammer for whom he had worked when he was an undergraduate and to see if he could get a uh, job in John's graphics lab. Um, by that point we had married, I was teaching out in Zebulon and Nick was having way more fun doing computer graphics at state than I was having teaching junior high in Zebulon. Um, so after I'd been in Zebulon a year, I we talked about it, decided we had enough money just merely that um, I could go back to school as well. And I went and talked myself into uh, double E to the double E department. I was thinking, okay, which engineering should I do? And, and which one was the most, most mathematical? And that was electrical. And besides Nick was, was already doing graphics at that point. And now, really how, having fun. <laughs> how is uh, electronics uh, have, what does it have to do with mathematics? Oh, um, um, fields theory, you know, fields, uh, electromagnetics, um, Vacuum it's been a long time. I, I, it was interesting. I had to go back and retake the third semester of calculus because they didn't think my Duke one was good enough. And you only have to remember how to integrate and differentiate sine, cosine, e to the ax, and use the chain rule. And I think that's all the calculus for what I was doing that I needed to know. Um, I guess in the long run, one, there wasn't a lot of math. Um, but once we started drawing pictures, there was, of course. Did you uh, grow up in an analog era with vacuum tubes or did you encounter transistors first? I, I encountered transistors. Uh, they were still, they were, they were not completely brand new, but they were still expensive. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I didn't start. And when we did our early digital, obviously when we did our digital design courses, well, we did them with transistors. We did them with uh, 7,400 TTL logic. And when did you discover uh, integrated circuits? That, that was then. Uh-huh, yep. when would that be, what year? Uh, uh, I went back to school in 76, when I was 28 in double E. I was one of four women out of 200 uh, sophomores that year. Um, and we started using IC's second semester of that year. So spring of 77. So uh, tell us about these early frame store dis image display devices. I mean, I'm well, aware of, I'm aware, I know an oscilloscope is. But, uh. <laughs> um, Well, what was in the lab while I was, I started off as a sophomore in double E, so I didn't get to do anything very exciting um, for a couple of years, but I could watch what Nick and them were doing. And they had a, a raster stroke machine. It was an adage AGT30. Um, and the cool thing about that was, was it had a, a hybrid analog digital set of, um, controls that did the rotations and zooming. So yes, it was a line drawing, 
but I never used a graphics box that I couldn't reach over and touch a dial and twirl the dial and have the image move, which I think is uh, graphics were always interactive. I never, I never had to do, well, until I quit uh, working and had to use my IBM PC, I never had graphics that wouldn't move mm-hmm. and be real time. Yeah, we've so gone that, backwards, that, haven't we? Yeah, well, so, so uh, there was a, a stroker and then they had built a, um, an interface to a line scan uh, video disc that would put color images up on a TV. Uh, so I got to see color images there. And of course, that was at best eight bits. And it may have been um, 332, red, green, blue. Yep. Uh, but I'm, but I, I, I don't know. Did you ever meet Ivan Sutherland and that crew? I did meet Ivan Sutherland. Tell us about that, please. That, the, the, the worst um, story about Ivan Sutherland is that my dad was at MIT and we went back to MIT for his 30th reunion, which would have been 1963. One of the laboratories that was on uh, doing demos was Ivan's lab, the lab Ivan was in. And I got to see Sketchpad running in 1963. Now, I do not remember it. My sister remembers it distinctly, but I do not remember it. Um, I subsequently met Ivan when he came and visited at Carolina. And then eventually for a while I was at, uh, when I was at Sun, I was at part of Sun Labs. And of course he was head of Sun Labs. And you another pioneer that you knew or met was Fred Brooks. Yes. Tell us about this man, please. What was he famous for? Uh, he's famous for leading the projects for the IBM 360, the hardware and then the software and then the whole thing. Um, but he always knew he wanted to go and be an academic. So he came to Carolina and uh, founded the department here. He is, family is from Eastern North Carolina and he grew up in Kinston, I guess. Um, After Sun closed the shop here, I got asked to come to Carolina and run the graphics, be the manager of the graphics lab. And I worked very closely with Henry and Fred uh, and manage their projects. After working for Henry for a while, I worked with Fred and then exclusively worked with Fred for about 20 years and we ran the VR program there. So I was, I was his primary academic collaborator from about 96 to 16. That would be Fred, that would be uh, Fuchs would be the the other man you mentioned. Yes, sorry, Henry Fuchs. Yes. Henry Fuchs, so tell us about him, please. Uh, he's a Utah person. Start Henry Fuchs as a? Henry Fuchs is a uh, Utah grad. Um, he went to Texas someplace, I don't know whether it was UT Austin or, or where, um, was interested, always interested in um, making things go faster and being interactive. And he came and met Fred and they headed off like gangbusters and he came to Carolina and then started the program for pixel planes and then pixel flow. And he continues to do research in trying to make um, video conferencing and uh, remote, sen- remote collaboration to be as realistic as possible. So at some point you finished a PhD. No, no, <laughs> no. Um, but we started the first company and I quit and finished my master's degree. And then I went back to Adage and then we left Adage and founded Transept. Uh, and then did Transept, got bought by Sun. Sun pulled out and we went to uh, Carolina. So um, I have a master's. Who's and, the we? Excuse me, um, Nick and I, Nick England and I. Uh, and, uh, the done, t- and, and we are married. And the two of you do like to found companies. Uh, we did two together and then he did several others. <laughs> and uh, what's it like starting a small business in a high technology area? Uh, the first one, you don't have any idea how hard it's going to be and you make all kinds of mistakes. Um, but we had people who wanted copies of his PhD project, which he never finished either. 
uh, his degree. Um, and so we built this tool for people. Um, you know, you sweep the floors and you design uh, boards and uh, you write code. And uh, back in the day, we were laying out boards uh, with sticky uh, templates on acetate. It was, uh, it was very primitive in the late 70s. Um, Do you program? No. No. I try not to. You do do electrical design, though. Sort of I did. Design. I did you, back in the day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, what's the uh, what, what was your encounter with the first microprocessors? How did they fit in and change things? I uh, when Nick was doing his design at State, the 2900 series of 8 bit bit slice processors were brand new 16k by one uh, DRAMs were brand new and 60 or 70 dollars a piece so I had a class where we used 6800s but um, the first uh, processor that I ever really inter uh, interacted with was the 2900 series <clears throat> one of the things I designed was a programmable matrix multiplier which had a 16 by 16 multiplier accumulator chip and then ancillary logic around it that allowed me to program it um, to basically to do matrix multiplies for transformations. When you're doing uh, fast real-time graphics, uh, the issue of CPU speed is always a factor and there's a tendency or a temptation to resort to using hardware to do the uh, computations. So how do you balance the two and how do you know what the solutions are and how do you feel your way through that one? You hire somebody who's really good at program design and also maybe has a, some hardware experience and can understand how to split the task up between the CPU. That was one of the reasons that the machines our companies built were um, as general purpose as they were because getting things in and out of the CPU was just so hard. So we basically made a computer that hung on a computer. Um, today, we just call them GPUs, but ours was as big as a dorm refrigerator. Mm -hmm. um, it's, if you want it to go fast, it's gonna be a, a memory access and um, bus congestion. And the things we built had multiple processing units. So it was a, a very wide instruction word. They have, you could do in several independent things at the same time and then chunk through your clock and then get your, get your answer out at the bottom. So thinking very carefully about what were the most important algorithms to go fast and how to map them onto the available hardware so that you could then get a system that would run uh, as fast as possible. Did you build these boxes one by one by hand or did you have a assembly line? Um, we built them one by one by hand for a few and then we had too much for us to do and we had to do things like borrow money. Uh, and uh, we hired uh, students from NC State and uh, a friend had uh, was at a church that had a number of Vietnamese refugees and we got one Vietnamese refugee. And then I guess we eventually had about 20. And uh, I, one of the things we'd like to talk about is how good our potluck lunches were mm -hmm. because of the wonderful uh, Vietnamese food. Um, and then when we got bought the, uh, by Adage, the first company was bought by Adage and they, uh, had automated wire wrapping machines and then eventually uh, relayed the boards out so that they could be flow soldered. So they were no longer wire wrapped. So they were printed circuit boards? Uh, eventually. So eventually. we had, yeah. Um, the ones that we used that we wire wrapped, uh, power and ground were plated and on the memory arrays, the signal, the address signal lines and the data signal lines. Uh, but other stuff was just was wire wrapped. And so you 
the first company you had was tell Iconist. us about the, Iconist. Iconist tell us about, tell us about that please um Iconis was formed uh when we were still in graduate school i was in the middle of my second year of school as an undergraduate really um and we had take people had seen the frame buffer that nick had built at carolina i mean at state and were interested in having a, a copy of it and i remember we sat around the uh our table one afternoon and didn't get up until it was way way after dark and deciding that we were gonna try to do it. Um, engaged my brother, to, who was a PhD mathematician, to keep the books for us and borrowed some money and uh, took down the model railroad and uh, put our shop in the, in the back room over the garage. And was it a success? Um, we didn't lose any money, uh, didn't make a great deal. Uh, it was, we ran out of money and we uh, sold it once, then sold it to Adage. And uh, once we were bought by Adage, we at least got uh, reasonable uh, salaries, which was nice. Um, they sold maybe 600 copies of it. Mm. So there were, uh, you know, it, a very modest success, but it was, Adage bought us in 82. So this was a very long time ago. Mm -hmm. And then you created another company. We did, uh, Transept Systems. Uh, we took one of uh, our primary friends and colleagues out of Iconis named Tim Van Hook, who had come from Chuck Sury's lab at Ohio State. And Nick and Tim and I founded Transept. We were making the same sort of things, but uh, this was 87, 86, 87. And so it was the era of workstations. Uh, and the Sun was the primary one. We looked at which one we wanted to build for. And the system that had been in a big box and was multiple cards now was on, I think, three cards that went into a Sun chassis. So, Tell us about the merger of vector graphics and raster graphics and how that came about, because you're very close to that. Um, your, your displays were raster graphic displays. They were. We were relatively early among the full color frame buffers, so 24 bits per, six, per pixel. And our frame buffers were always, at, in fact, 32 bits per pixel. So there was red, green, blue, and what has come to be called alpha, uh, which we would sometimes use as an overlay channel or as an alpha channel. Um, all of the memory that was in the Iconis and in the transept could be displayed, or you could use it as processor memory. So it was multi-purpose. Um, we had to be able to draw lines because that was expected for many apps. Uh, we did adequately. We didn't draw lines and polygons nearly as fast as Silicon Graphics did, but we could do volume rendering and image processing that at that point they could not do. Mm -hmm. So, um, the, actually, the impetus for Nick's prog project was NASA wanted to know, could you build a cockpit display with a raster display rather than a vector display and have it be adequate for a pilot? Mm -hmm. So, uh, that was the motivation to get the original 2-bit frame buffer that led to the 8-bit frame buffer that led to the companies. And what happened after that? Well, we uh, made thousand by thousand displays. Uh, that was, we were very early in the thousand squared, 24 bit and 32 bit um, displays. The processor that was in there, the bit slices, uh, the generations rolled and we used TI chips in the, in the transit machine. And I spent a lot more time uh, building tools for people for imaging applications, uh, volume visualization applications, both medical and, and geological exploration, mm -hmm. um, high quality rendering. So there was a ray tracer uh, back in the day. And there was another one, but I've forgotten what the fourth one was. Image processing, perhaps medical? Yes. Uh, uh, 2D medical as well as 3D medical and imaging for the um, uh, security agencies 
mm-hmm. were, were uh, good customers. How did that end? Um, well, you know, when uh, Mom's Apple Pie Company in McLean, Virginia buys a machine, you ship it away, they send you a check, and you never hear from them again. Mm-hmm. So we assume it went okay. All right, it worked. <laughs> How did you discover SIGGRAPH? Uh, um, John Stodhammer's lab, I think, had three papers in the very first SIGGRAPH. Mm-hmm. There are at least two. So people from the lab that Nick was in, and then later I was in, went to the very first one and the second one and the third one. Um, so I knew about it from the beginning. Um, once we were beginning to think about wanting to be involved in graphics you know, prof- professionally forever, uh, we went to our first SIGGRAPH in 1977. And I don't know exactly how I got hooked up with the chapters people, but I uh, talked to the chapters people, the research triangle with the work at Carolina and and the work at state was a a good hotbed to think about having a professional chapter of SIGGRAPH. And um, we formed one um, and ran it for a while. And then I went off and finished my degree and then I've reformed it. And then in its third incarnation, as many of the local chapters did, it it began to um, cater to the people who were in the uh, entertainment industry that were beginning to be located here in the Triangle. Mm -hmm. But you became much more involved in the National SIGGRAPH. Tell us about that, please. Um, You know, uh, you have friends, Kelly Booth and John Beatty, uh, late John Beatty from Waterloo were good customers. And Kelly and John chaired maybe 1983 SIGGRAPH. Um, but at some point, Kelly said, who had been chair of um, president of SIGGRAPH, not of the conference, but of the, he'd been a conference chair, but also uh, of the organization. And he said, why don't you run for the executive committee? And I said, okay, I can do that. Uh, so I ran for that, got elected in 1990, and then was asked to run for chair. And was chair in 93 and 94. Tell us about that experience, please. (laughs) Um, It was a period of very rapid growth in the conference. And there were conflicting uh, desires among different communities uh, with, are we gonna be really a technical thing? How much um, entertainment work are we gonna do? How much applications work? are we gonna do? Um, so it was, it was an interesting, it was an interesting time. Um, ACM had made an accounting error and the day I took over as chair of the organization, ACM uh, told me we were a million dollars in debt. Um, luckily the conference the next year uh, did very well and we were able to get out ourselves out of that hole. So there were, there were many challenges and running this organization and volunteers uh, herding cats. Somebody said it's cats and rabbits at the same time. So were you and have you been involved uh, uh, since in various ways? Um, I was on the executive committee as past chair for it seemed like forever. Um, And then really when I began doing serious VR research, SIGGRAPH I didn't seem to have a place for that at the time, which was around 2000 and just before 2000. Uh, so I, I went to most of the conferences, but I was not engaged in the management and actually was not until they finally uh, formed a, a full standing committee for ACM, for cigarette history. And I uh, became chair of that. So that was three years ago. So from I'm, sort of... Yeah, I'm curious about your, um, curious to uh, explore this uh, conflict you described between the various factions of, of SIGGRAPH. I think in my own recollection, the conference grew and grew and grew, and it reached some point at which the, uh, shall we say, the computational geometry people wanted one thing, the artists wanted something else, the video game people uh, were briefly there. The CAD CAM people uh, came and went. Uh, the mapping people were never very uh, prominent. 
Um, but uh, the ability of all this to kind of hold together, it kind of fractured. The, the history of the organization is very interesting as you look at new areas that became important and then either went off and, and did their own thing. Like the entire uh, visualization conference, the IEEE VR uh, the visualization came out of a couple of boffs that we ran. Um, that, so this sort of, there wasn't a place for that in the papers. And if, and there had, for the academics, there had to be a venue for the academic research to be presented because that's how people got tenure, et cetera. Um, VR similarly went away. A CAD's an interesting um, example because it just got subsumed in computer aided design and ECAD. Graphics just became part of their ecosystem. And so they didn't need um, the general graphics conference. Now there are people who were developing and doing research in CAD machines and ECAD machines needed the new research that was coming from the SIGGRAPH community, but that's, that's a subset and not the people who got to go to AutoCAD for instance. Lauren and I did a show on uh, virtual reality at some point, SIGGRAPH I know, and we interviewed a lot of uh, people and uh, you know, uh, head mounted displays and uh, caves and things like that. Um, I was at a conference not too long ago and somebody showed me a pair of goggles you put on and it was like they thought this was the most amazing thing and <laughs> I had seen this like uh, two decades ago and was not very impressed but uh, they thought that this was something to really capital, you know, invest heavily in and capitalize in. But I've been, uh, uh, you, you mentioned earlier that VR is one of your interests and something you've pursued. And I'd like you to, if you'd be so kind to talk about it and where it's been successful, where, it's, where it hasn't met expectations and what might happen in that milieu in the near future. Um what I was interested in, uh, let me uh, drop back. Not only do I have a master's degree in electrical engineering, I have a master's degree in counseling. So I've got the people side and I did perception work as well as the electrical engineering side. So when Fred and I started uh, doing research and there was VR work going on, they had built the wide area tracker that became the highball. Um, they had enough money to buy some uh, goggles and we had a gigantic SGI system. I mean, huge SGI system to drive the, the thing. Um, that was the point in the mid nineties that the hardware was still the stumbling block. It was the squeaky wheel. So we needed to get enough resolution, enough a fast enough update rate and low enough latency to not make people sick um, and good enough tracking. And to some extent, those are the same issues that we still have today. Um, yes, you put on new goggles, but the resolution was higher. Probably the field of view was higher. The um, update rate was better and the displays are way more colorful. Um, and they're just better because technology has moved on. Um, so, so Fred and I, realized we did a system that was the very best application we could. We optimized everything we knew how to optimize. And people were stunned at how good it was. It was the, the famous pit where you had to look over and you were looking down 20 feet and you got scared. You actually got mm. scared. Um, and he said, ah, oh, we've done it. And I said, yes, but we don't know which of the things we optimized made the difference. So we spent about 10 years just sort of going through them one at a time saying, let's vary this one and see what happens. Let's vary this one and see what happens. Um, mostly people just ask the users, how did you feel? How did you like it? Did you feel like you were present? Were you scared? Um, but we really wanted to have something that measured more objectively. So because it was a fear inducing, we could measure physiological response like heart rate and um, palm sweat. 
Um, and that was, um, that was interesting. We graduated a number of PhDs uh, doing that work. Um, and so we were beginning to look a little more at what the impact on the person was. So yes, we, we varied the technology and looked at the impact on the person. Um, as that has gone along, um, the, some of the work I'm work doing now, we're looking very much even more at the, what do you have to know to have a good application and what do you have to know about the person who's using it in order for the experience to be effective uh, and accomplish what the designer wants to accomplish. So I think that as the, as the technology has become less of a stumbling block, we are able to look at these, I hate to say more sophisticated, but at least the, the human aspects, which is uh, confoundingly complicated um, oftentimes. Um, the uh, game people seem to have uh, some VR products. I don't know how good they are, but they... You know, I am not a gamer. Um, mm. I believe that they have done some nice work. They, they work on the idea of flow and getting the level of challenge and the, the user's ability at just the right place so that they stay motivated to keep going on and on. Um, and, and that's interesting to talk to those people. You, like, like everything, there's folks who are extremely thoughtful and work at a very high uh, level in thinking about how to make things effective. And then you've got um, people who build games and uh, you know, teenagers who build games in their basements. And um, some of those we may have difficulty with if people get sick and have accidents. What about VR in like medical profession where it's, uh, you're using it to do uh, uh, inside the body a visualization? You know, there have been fascinating technical challenges for that. How do you get the uh, right sort of data from cameras that are on laparoscopic tools to be able to reconstruct? How do you have the imagery be good? And then, you know, you've got to connect that to the robots uh, uh, for the physicians. I think the, the training, the being able to train virtually uh, is is powerful. I mean, just, we know it's powerful in flight simulators. I think we're seeing it become more and more powerful in medical. I've heard stories about training like fighters, uh, firefighters uh, for ships where you all of a sudden uh, they're going into an environment. You, they've never been in that environment before, but you present the environment for them. So they know, you know, where the, where the walls are, where the turns are, how to get in, how to get out, that kind of stuff. I you got to Got to have the models for that. And I think that with all of the computer vision based modeling, um, it's interesting to see how the, the imaging aspects of vision and using that to model and, and the way the um, Oculus models from uh, the cameras, uh, it's just amazing. Uh, but it brings imaging back to what was polygons for us. Mm -hmm. um, Sometimes I don't think resolution is as important as everybody gives it, uh, everybody says it is. Whether it needs to be 4K squared or, uh, or, or 768 or by 512, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, that depends on what you want to look at. Mm -hmm. um, Once we got, so we were doing aliasing really well, anti-aliasing really well. Uh, there are many things that were less, uh, became less important, but I don't want to go back to um, looking at a 256 squared head mount. Mm -hmm. um, I, I remember when we got our first 512 squared uh, display head mount, it was enormously different and mm -hmm. a thousands even better, obviously. I, um... We uh, I, you know, work in the movie business some, and there's an obsession with not just 2K, but 4K. And then some people are trying to sell 8K. And yet my naivety is that most people are, a huge amount of people are watching uh, these movies on uh, cell phones. And if they're not watching them on cell phones, they're watching them on home, uh, home displays that are uh, coming in from the internet with bandwidths, which would appall any electrical engineer. 
and yet nobody seems to uh, complain very much, even when the stuff breaks up into blocks on their screen. Um, no comment. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's uh, it's not perfect, and uh, our eyes do a nice job of uh, uh, filtering, and unless it becomes egregious. Now, when we went to buy a our first uh, LCD television, which was uh, way recently compared to things. Um, we looked at the 4Ks, they were uh, brand new, fairly, fairly new, and there, there wasn't much content. And being electrical engineers who've had a lot, taken a lot of signal processing, we went over there and said, oh, you, look at, you can look at the discrete cosine transform uh, jaggies moving up and down on the, on the edges. And, you know, decided, well, the artifacts of downcoding of upcoding from 1K or 2K to 4K wasn't worth it. Um, mm -hmm. I, this was probably five, six years ago, but. Uh, Where is SIGGRAPH at now and what do you see the future of the organization? Um, at another one of those points, it will be 50 years, the conference will be 50 years old in 2023. The organization turned 50 years old a couple of years ago. Um, we, it was easier 20 years ago or 25 years ago to see new cool things that were coming. So one of SIGGRAPH's challenges now is to identify the, what are the up and coming technologies that we want to be out front in and be recognized as a leader in promoting that new technology and how it's gonna impact the world. Um, what is the new technology? I, you know, that's, um, <clears throat> I get to look back instead of forward as history chair. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of people who are doing frontiers kind of work and who are looking at that um, kind of thing. What are the uh, frontiers? Right I think now? it's, I, you know, I'm, Justin, I'm really not good at it. Mm -hmm. um, I saw the life of I saw the life of Pi and uh, was pretty impressed with the quality. I never thought in my lifetime I would see anything like that, and it is sufficiently intimidating that uh, you know I don't need to be involved in making images of that agony anymore or that. <laughs> well, you know the there's um, not the the displays aren't solved. You know, there's people who want to put the displays on contact lenses and have all this voltage right there in your eye and the, the retina displays that were direct on the retina that were uh, proposed. The uh, ability to model in, in detail in real time, the environment you're in is not there yet. I, unfortunately, these are, these are really hard problems that are fundamental that we haven't solved and they're not yet, they're, they're not new leading edge. Um, when the, within the right researchers, they are. Um, Have we become uh, 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 taken over by Hollywood? Uh, an, interesting, an interesting fact from the last, um, user survey of post-conference survey they did of attendees was um, in people's free form answers. Half of the people said there's way too much technology and academic stuff and um, we really need more entertainment. And half of the people said there's way too much entertainment and rah-rah stuff and we need more technology. Um, I confess I was very surprised that that, that balance was reported to be that. Um, sampling, you, you know, given, given the percentage of people who come from entertainment and for entertainment, uh, you wonder what the balance of attendees and the balance of people who return their, I, that's the, that's the uh, psychologist in me looking at, at sampling uh, populations. Um, but I well, thought that was, an, that was an, interesting, an interesting factoid. Um, let me ask you a few questions about um, working with people, if I may. 
-hmm. So um, since we're doing history uh, and since people who study history uh, are people who are looking at it from you know, into the past, what, what pearls of wisdom can we share with young people who want to start a small business in a technology area? What, what, what's, what, what's, what, what mud pits or quicksand is awaiting them and how might they have a survival chance of, of, of making it through? Don't, so I would tell potential entrepreneurs don't do it unless you absolutely have to do it, unless you believe you have to do it. As, as Nick is fond of saying, lie down till the feeling goes away. And if you get up the third time and you still want to do it, then think about it, um, doing it. Uh, you have to be incredibly motivated. Um, it's not going to be easy to get venture money and fancy offices and big salaries. If you're lucky, you'll get out without losing any money. If you're very lucky, you'll make some money. Um, but it is a wonderful experience like none, none other. Uh, building a tool that your customers use to do neat stuff, world-changing stuff that changes people's lives, lives that entertains people is a feeling like none other. It is just more fun than anything else. Um, when Nick and I both ended up in, at Carolina, we fit right into the um, culture over there that Dr. Brooks had, had done of the computer scientist as toolsmith. He's really an engineer, Dr. Brooks is. Um, and just building things that people can use to do stuff is, and seeing it. <laughs> One of the things when I was at Syracuse, which impressed me was that uh, there were a lot of women in the computer center. And I drew the conclusion that the computer was extremely agnostic to uh, who was programming it. And as long as the punch cards flowed through the card reader properly and they produced an outcome that was correct, the computer was quite happy. So I've always sort of believed the myth that women had a lot of opportunity in the computer sciences. But yet I've read lately in some newspapers that that's not a true statement. Would you care to comment on that? I, I was early enough and I really had a charmed career. Um, I, it was not, um, I, I did things like when I was in school, I always signed my papers MC, Whitten. Um, I didn't say Mary. Um, I finally had to go see the uh, teaching assistant one day for a problem I couldn't solve. And he turned and said, oh, you're MC. Uh, so, you know, and to some extent, I was, whole, I was hiding the fact that I was a woman doing these problems. I didn't want that to be a factor. Um, I was older than most of my colleagues. And I just... Kind of, I, you know, I was married, and so I didn't have to date. So that there was a whole, that whole thing I didn't have to deal with. I mean, that was charmed time to be um, in school. Now, um, and then we started a company, and I was one of the founders. Um, it's very obvious that Nick and I have different last names. That was very important to me when we did the company. I didn't want to be the little woman who was helping. No, I was the vice president for marketing and sales and the designer of you know, this set of boards. Um, so again, it was fortuitous where I was. Um, and at Carolina, I kind of already had a reputation, a technical reputation when I got there. And um, I, I, you know, it took a while to sort of settle in over there, but then, um, you know, I just did my thing. Now, I, I see, I have seen women in the department have, have some difficulty. There are, um, I think everywhere they're, they're, I don't want to say older, but there are people who have ideas that have not been, uh, have, have not modernized. I think that, 
maybe we'll grow out of them as a younger generation. I, I, I just, I just have to, I just have to hope. And I don't, you know, I don't know what to do about um, the locker room sort of atmosphere that, uh, or the reputation of startups that um, guys are just um, not polite, not respectful, uh, don't appreciate what the women bring to their can bring to their teams. Um, but I've not, I've never worked in an environment like that. So um, in an environment like SIGGRAPH where you're also doing quote management unquote, uh, how in a company you, uh, you issue orders in an organization <laughs> like SIGGRAPH, you uh, probably make requests. Can you share with us a little bit about the dynamics of a, of a not-for-profit uh, big trade conference organization and, and how you have to, some tips on how to how a whether it's a man or a woman, how to go about uh, keeping the peace and, and making progress? <laughs> you were you were going all around um, the things that were difficult for me when I was chair of SIGREF, uh, and there were uh, personality conflicts and uh, people who uh, they're not only the difference between the different academic areas and interest areas, but art and, and technology and CAD and technology, uh, CAD and you know, whatever. Um, but the conference was the money maker and the organization uh, was a money spender to do supporting activities. Had to get plans that people would buy into. Uh, one of the things that we did while I was chair was have a uh, two and a half day planning meeting where we looked at what SIGGRAF wanted to do and should be doing uh, as we moved into the 21st century. Um, and that was run with the idea of finding common ground between the different groups and identifying the most important areas for us to work on and work in and through over the next five to 10 years. That, that, that guidance has uh, carried the organization, well, carried it, I think, up through maybe 2010. And then it's, it, the, the sort of the long-term growth path has not been as clear since then. Um, but you know, again, I wasn't I wasn't there. It made a huge difference to have that real meeting of the minds and people. You know, there was a group that was really interested in becoming uh, more involved in internationally, and they went off and did that. I mean, we it, a lot of good things came out of that. And when I looked at five years later, we had made good progress in each of the areas identified um, at that meeting. And that gave everybody a place that they felt they were invested in making progress in an area. And when they've got that, then you can, you can nudge them along when they're basically bought in. One thing that's come up in a couple of the conversations has to do with uh, complexity of systems. Uh, I, as a victim of system complexity, am uh, eager to hear thoughts on, especially pessimistic thoughts among people like you on issues of complexity. Uh, Case said that scalability is one of the hugest challenges of all. And uh, I don't have to go much further than my Macintosh to uh, agree with him. Uh, but uh, would you care to talk about some of the, the, the challenge to scalability, whether it's in an organizational structure or whether it's in a technological structure like a frame buffer or a, a piece of computer hardware? Or an airplane, which I politely, <laughs> which I politely did not ask him about. Um, Scalability and complexity. An amazing thing to me is uh, the Iconis, particularly the process or the whole system for its day was hugely complex, but the scale of the number of transistors that are in modern GPUs is just you know, crazy different. But the designers still have to look at the same things. 
the memory bandwidth and, and the bus structure. And uh, so the comp it's enormously more complex. A lot of times it's uh, parallel. And so you're replicating uh, to make it happen. But there are a lot of fundamental challenges that are the same. I That just surprises me. Uh, I am, I keep being very thankful that there was one machine I knew as intimately as I knew that one, because I can look at almost any machine now and have a sense of how it works. Um, people structures are, are harder because the components are so variable. And if the interests become broader and the people become more different from each other, then that's enormously complex. And I think that's, um, that's, that's a problem that any large organization has that has things that are as different as the digital arts community and the uh, computational photography community in the same group. Um, I mean, somehow, how do you get them together moving forward? Um, people are more, are harder to work with than integrated circuits. Uh, in terms of <laughs> education, of which you are a, a, a part-time educator at the least, if not a full-time one with your life presence, uh, it seems to me, and I'd like you to react, that much of what we're teaching these days in our colleges and universities is uh, what I might call application craft and not fundamentals. We teach somebody how to use a uh, Maya software, but we don't teach them what the uh, translation, rotation, and scaling is three basic things. And I think this kind, I hypothesize that this kind of thinking permeates much of education. And I'd like you to comment on this, whether you, where you see things and what's good and what's bad and are blah, blah, blah. Go ahead, please. Um, I, am, um, <clears throat> I am sympathetic to the fact that people want to learn how to do stuff and the way they get stuff done now is with tools. And so they want to learn to use the tools. That is not training our next level of people who will make fundamental advances unless they get up there to the point that the tools don't work for them. And then they've got to learn how to make a better tool. And that may mean they have to go back and learn the fundamentals of both rotation transformations. Um, I, one of the things I, that interests me is where people learn to think and do problem solving. And where I did a lot of that was you do it by just solving a lot of problems. And I did it in my two semesters of physics and I did it in my, in my double E courses where you did problem sets every week in every course. Um, and how do, you, how do you teach that sort of thinking when you're teaching people Maya? You know, if, they're, if they learn if then else, then yeah, that's a concept and you can learn it in another in many languages, but I don't know that they're getting the kind of problem solving, exposure to problem solving and to debugging. Oh. When you, <laughs> you know, that, that uh, um, you just fiddle around until you make it work. Well, no, that's not how it works. That's not how you no. do it. I had an MIT graduate student, master's graduate student I hired one day and he comes up with some sort of problem in a piece of code and uh, you know, suggested to me that the computer was not calculating correctly. A, a situation which I've seen maybe once in my life, okay? And I suggested to him that he put a print statement that I took, he had a print out. I opened it to the middle and I said, put a print statement here. And he says, but I know what all the values are there. And I said, well, then the results should be correct. And he said, well, no, no, but I said, go do it. 
And the uh, next day I saw him and I say, well, what happened? And he says, he looks at me very sheepishly and he says, well, I, I found the bug. But that divide and conquer, he had not been, he had somehow or another, he had not been taught that in graduate school that he uh, needed to verify what he thought was happening with just a few simple print statements and that that would, uh, that would do it. And so. that is so much more difficult. Back when I was building hardware, you know, you would put a scope probe on a, a wire wrap pen and it, <laughs> and you could tell if it was right or wrong, um, mm -hmm. if it was too early or too late. Um, so it, uh, it's uh, that debugging is harder, but I don't think I don't think the programmers are taught to do it well. And I think that's part of problem solving. Yes, um, yes. So that, I'm, I'm not sure I've answered your question, but I, I've told you what I worry about. Well, more problems, education. more problems, a good problem solving in the educational milieu and uh, uh, learning basics. And I don't yeah. think it's just computer science. We can all we can teach someone how to hammer a nail, but that does not mean that they can build a, 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 a an outhouse correctly. Yeah. Uh, and the, uh, just knowing how the boards fit together. So there, so, and also some of it is you know we do have a few thousand years of learning about things. <laughs> We and we we don't have to learn them all all over again. And uh, so, know, that, so that uh, actually is another one of my pet peeves, which is reviewing papers. And there is nothing cited that is before 2000. Well, hmm. as one of our graduate students famously said about the seminal papers book, those old guys got a lot of things right. And I said, yeah. <laughs> I um, asked Steve, Kuhn one, Kuhn, Steve Kuhns once about transformation matrices. And he looks at me kind of astoundedly and says, oh yes, Hatterman in 1886 or, or something like that. It was yeah. like, yeah. and uh, I asked him about uh, you know, the splines and I said, well, what about, very good question. What about railroad? How do the railroads do it? And mm -hmm. he says, oh, you drive spikes in the ground and you bend the way, you bend the rail, you literally bend the rail through it. And that forms a, the proper curvature. Wow. So this was not something that used math either, but it was a mechanical. And he says, he told me that was where the word comes from, is from me the mechanical forming of, of shapes using, you know, bending like wood or metal around spikes. Anyway, I shouldn't be the one talking. You're the one being interviewed and we're basically <laughs> out of time. So thank you very much. And you're, uh, you're very you welcome. Down, you'll go down in history, I'm sure, for many, many reasons. <laughs> I don't I don't know about that. <laughs>